Hello and welcome to video lecture number 84. Today we are looking at containment in a divided world. Our subsections are the Cold War in Europe from 1945 to 46, the containment strategy, and containment in Asia. With the defeat of Nazi tyranny and Japanese militarism, the new post-war world order was defined by the growing confrontation, uh, military, uh, economic, and ideological, between the two remaining superpowers. Uh, these are the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, containment of the Soviet Union became central to American foreign policy. The United States used economic as well as military means to pursue this policy. Uh, the Marshall Plan, for example, was formulated to stimulate Europe's distressed post-war economy and promote an economic recovery that would benefit the United States as well as the European participants uh, and also make Europe less susceptible to communism. To shield America's European allies from Soviet bloc military threats, the United States and, and 11 other nations created the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, uh, though not without debate in the U.S. Senate. Finally, uh, ominous developments during 1949, uh, the Communist Party's triumph over the nationals in China's civil war, uh, and the Soviets' detonation of their own atomic bomb, uh, led the National Security Council, the NSC, to prepare a sweeping strategic plan for waging what we call the Cold War. Two months after President Truman received the report known as NSC 68, uh, the Cold War became a hot war in Asia when communist North Korea invaded South Korea. So let's have a closer look then at this containment in a divided war with our first subsection, the Cold War in Europe. World War II set the basic conditions for Cold War rivalry. The Cold War would produce an arms race uh, through the military industrial complex. Uh, the interconnection of corporate influence of political party or, or policy in the interest of producing armaments for global warfare. Because the Soviet Union had been a victim of German aggression in two world wars now, Joseph Stalin was determined to prevent the rebuilding and rearming of its traditional foe. He insisted on a security zone of friendly governments in Eastern Europe for protection. At the Yalta Conference, uh, America and Britain agreed to recognize this Soviet sphere of influence uh, with the proviso that free and unfettered elections would be held as soon as possible. After Yalta, the Soviets made no move to hold the election, reorganize the Soviet installed governments. Recalling Britain's disastrous appeasement of Hitler in 1938, President Harry Truman decided that the United States had to take a hard line against Soviet expansion. At the 1945 Potsdam Conference of the United States, Britain, and the Soviet Union, Truman used what he called tough methods, uh, negotiations on critical post-war issues deadlocked, revealing serious cracks in this grand alliance. At Potsdam, uh, the Allies agreed to disarm Germany, uh, dismantle its military production facilities, and permit the occupying powers to extract reparations. Plans for future reunification of Germany stalled, uh, and the foundation was laid for what would later become the division of Germany into two nations, uh, into East Germany and West Germany. All right, our next subsection then is the containment strategy. As tensions mounted, the United States increasingly perceived Soviet expansionism as a threat to its own interests, and a new policy of containment began to take shape, uh, the most influential proponent of whom was George F. Kennan. The policy of containment crystallized in 1947, when suspected Soviet-backed communist guerrillas launched a civil war against the Greek government. Uh, causing the West to worry that Soviet influence in Greece threatened its interests in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, and in the Middle East, especially in Turkey. American reaction resulted in what was called the Truman Doctrine, uh, which called for large-scale military and economic assistance in order to prevent communism from taking hold in Greece and in Turkey. 
uh, which in turn lessened the threat to the entire Middle East, making it an early version of the domino theory. The resulting congressional appropriation reversed the post-war trend uh, toward sharp cuts in foreign spending, uh, and it marked a new level of commitment to this Cold War. The Marshall Plan, then, uh, sent relief to disastered, uh, uh, devastated European countries, and it helped to make them less susceptible to communism, which thrived in impoverished areas. Uh, the plan required that foreign aid dollars be spent on U.S. goods and services. The Marshall Plan met with opposition in Congress uh, until a communist coup occurred in Czechoslovakia in February 1948. Um, after which Congress voted overwhelmingly to approve funds for the program. Over the next four years, the United States contributed nearly $13 billion to a highly successful recovery. Uh, Western European economies revived, uh, opening new opportunities for international trade, uh, while Eastern Europe was influenced not to participate by the Soviet Union. So, the United States, France, and Great Britain initiated a program of economic reform also in West Berlin, which alarmed the Soviets, who responded with a blockade of the city. Now remember, Berlin at this point is divided into four zones, just like the whole of Germany was. So, Berlin itself was surrounded by Soviet-controlled territory in eastern Germany. Truman countered this blockade with airlifts of food and fuel. Uh, the blockade, which was lifted in May of 1949, made West Berlin a symbol of resistance to communism. In April of 1949, the United States entered into its first peacetime military alliance since the American Revolution, uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, uh, in which 12 nations agreed that an armed attack against one of them would be considered an attack against all of them. NATO also agreed uh, to the creation of the Federal Republic of Germany, or West Germany, uh, in May 1949. In October, the Soviets created the German Democratic Republic, or East Germany. The Soviets then organized the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance in 1949 and the military Warsaw Pact in 1955. In September of 49, American military intelligence had proof that the Soviets had detonated an atomic bomb. This revelation called for a major reassessment of American foreign policy. The Americans were no longer the only ones with the biggest bomb. Uh, to devise a new diplomatic and military blueprint, Truman turned to the National Security Council, the NSC, uh, which was an advisory body uh, established by the National Security Act of 1947 that also created the Department of Defense and the Central Intelligence Agency. The National Security Council gave a report known as NSC-68, uh, recommending the development of a hydrogen bomb, which increased U.S. conventional forces, um, established a strong system of alliances, and increased taxes in order to finance defense building. Okay, so let's go on then to our last subsection. Uh, containment in Asia. American policy in Asia was based as much on Asia's importance to the world economy as on the desire to contain communism. After dismantling Japan's military forces and weaponry, American occupation forces drafted a democratic constitution uh, and oversaw the rebuilding of the Japanese economy. In China, a civil war had been raging since the 1930s between communist forces led by Mao Zedong and uh, Zhao Enlai and conservative national forces uh, led under Chiang Kai-shek. For a time, the Truman administration attempted to help the nationalists by providing more than $2 billion in aid. But in August of 1949, it cut off that aid when reform did not occur. In October 1949, the People's Republic of China was formally established under Mao, and Chiang Kai-shek's forces fled to Taiwan. The China lobby in Congress uh, viewed Mao's success as a defeat for the United States. The China lobby's influence blocked U.S. recognition of Red China. 
leading instead to U.S. recognition of the exiled nationalist government in Taiwan. The United States also prevented China's admission to the United Nations. Uh, for almost 20 years, U.S. administrations treated mainland China, the world's most populous country, as a diplomatic non-entity. At the end of World War II, both the Soviet Union and the United States had troops in Korea uh, and divided the country into competing spheres of influence at the 38th parallel. The Soviets supported a communist government led by Kim Il-sung in North Korea. And the United States backed a Korean nationalist, Syngman Rhee, uh, in South Korea. On June 25th, 1950, North Koreans invaded across the 38th parallel. Truman asked the United Nations Security Council to authorize a police action against the invaders. The Security Council then voted to send what was called a peacekeeping force to Korea. Uh, though 14 non-communist nations sent troops, the UN army in Korea was overwhelmingly American. Uh, and by request of Truman to the Security Council, headed by General Douglas MacArthur. Months of fighting resulted in a stalemate. Uh, given this military stalemate, a drop in public support, and the fact that the United States did not want large numbers of troops tied down in Asia, uh, Truman and his advisors decided to work toward a negotiated peace in Korea. MacArthur who believed that the future of the United States lay in Asia and not in Europe, tried to execute his own foreign policy involving Korea and Taiwan and was drawn into a Republican challenge of Truman's conduct of the war. Truman then relieved MacArthur of his command based on insubordination, uh, though the decision to, re to relieve him was highly unpopular. Two years after truce talks began, an armistice was signed in July 1953. Uh, Korea was divided near the original border at the 38th parallel with a demilitarized zone between the two countries. And that zone is still there today. Truman committed troops to Korea without congressional approval, uh, setting a precedent for other undeclared wars. The war also expanded American involvement in Asia. Uh, transforming containment into a truly global policy. During the war, American defense expenditures grew uh, from $13 billion in 1950 to $50 billion in 1953, nearly two-thirds of the American budget. American foreign policy had become more global, more militarized, and more expensive. Uh, even in times of peace, the United States functioned in a state of permanent military mobilization. The Munich analogy, then, uh, of appeasing Hitler by offering him part of Czechoslovakia in 1938 guided American thinking when it came to anti-communist influence on American foreign policy. This thinking often drove the United States into armed conflicts that supported right-wing repressive regimes. All right, so this does conclude our video lecture for today. At this time, please answer your review questions at the bottom of the screen and continue on with your work.